So we are ready to start with your permission, Director General. My name is Eduardo Mansur. I am the uh, Director of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the FAO headquarters in Rome, Italy, and I'm very honored to be the moderator of this uh, webinar to launch a very important report, the Global Assessment of Soil Pollution. Today, we are also celebrating, uh, uh, pre-celebrating the World Environment Days uh, tomorrow, 5 June, so nothing more opportune for having here the heads of the FAO, Dr. Chu Don Yu, the head of the UN Environment, Dr. Inger Anderson, uh, His Excellency, uh, Dr. Uh, David Shokewanka, and others, the experts and panelists that are joining us uh, in this launching event, which is also part of the celebrations of the launching of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which is being formally launched today. The UN Decade uh, is uh, a decade declared by UN uh, General Assembly from 2021 to 2030. And uh, the official launching is today and tomorrow in the framework of the World Environment Day. Let me just in one minute uh, inform the participants and we are already over 500 participants uh, actually with us. Uh, we have a very large registration of 3,400 participants. So I would expect that more will join during this uh, session. Uh, I would uh, just like to welcome every one of you from the different parts of the world. We have uh, people from colleagues from the East, from the West, and here from this part of the world. So good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, the, if you have, uh, use please the chat to, to, for any specific comment, but there is a, uh, uh, in your menu an option for questions and answers. So if you want to put questions and receive answers from the team, that is assisting uh, the organization of this webinar, both from FAO Global Soil Partnership and from the United Nations Environment Program, uh, please place your comments on uh, the Q&A uh, uh, session of the, the Zoom. Uh, we are all getting familiar in this new reality of using these technologies. Another one that is available in this session are interpretation. Ustedes son muy bienvenidos a utilizar la interpretación en español. Vous êtes très bienvenu de utiliser la interpretación en français. We have the interpretation button. You are welcome to use uh, the interpretation as um, uh, you feel more comfortable with. Uh, without further ado, it's my big honor to invite the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization of United Nations FAO, Dr. Chu Dong Yu, to introduce to this webinar his opening remarks. Dr. Chu, honor to give you the floor. Thank you, Eduardo Mansour. Honorable Vice President David Chokag uh, and Mrs. Inga Anese and dear colleagues, welcome you to launch of the Global Assessment of Soil Pollution Report. Soil health is a fundamental issue for plant has planet has and also i would like to start to congratulate congratulate all my colleagues tomorrow we will have an environment day yeah? but since it's a saturday so i i started to congratulate you and the greetings you to all of us let's work hard to make sustainable environment healthy environment a good environment what you say, you like to say. Soil pollution, jeopardizing crop yield, dietary nutrition, food safety, rural incomes, human health, and the health of our ecosystem. Soil protection is of the utmost importance to ensure the success of our future agri food systems, ecosystem restoration, and all lives on the air. As revealed, in this report, industry and the mining activists are able and the industry waste and the unsustainable agricultural practice are the main source of the driving soil pollution worth. 
with the rapid population growth and urbanization, industrialization, annual waste is projected to increase to 3.4 billion tons in 2050. The use of plastic in agriculture has also increased greatly in the recent decades, representing a significant source of soil and environment pollution. About 80% of the marine pollution comes from land-based activities. Erosion of polluted soil contributed to the excessive loading of the plastic, nutrients, and organic chemicals into lakes, rivers, and the sea. Ladies and gentlemen, all these hard facts from the report should push us to act now. Our society wants more nutritious and safe food, free of the contaminants and the pathogens. This is the reflecting in our work, how to transform our agro-food systems for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, a better life, leaving no one behind. We must address the soil fertility, soil biodiversity, and soil pollution to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Bring together science and policy to understand the status, causes, impacts, and the pollution to soil pollution is crucial. Today's global standard report on soil pollution reef respond to the UN Environment Assembly's resolution, manage soil pollution to achieve sustainable development. It is the result of the inclusive process with the scientists from around the world, consolidating science behind soil pollution and proposing concrete action. I really appreciate all the contribution from the scientific community and my colleague, used to be, I was also a scientist. Eh? I know the, it's, a, it's a, of the science-based and the fundamental, uh, uh, solid uh, 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 fundamentals is the first step. But we need more politicians, more economists, and more other key players to work together. I'm hopeful that the findings of this report will pave the way for joint efforts to stop soil pollution and build up the coherent solution for soil recovery. We need a soil recovery because we have more people to be well fed by 2050, about 10 billion population to come. Distinguished participants, boosting soil health and preventing soil pollution must be part of international agendas. This includes the UN decade on ecosystem restoration as well as the upcoming US conference on climate change, biodiversity, and the desertification, and the UN Food Assist Summit, and others. Together, we can make health soils for all and for long. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Director General, for your inspiring words and for recalling that this meeting today, this webinar today, was nurtured in May 2018, when FAO hosted the Global Symposium on Soil Pollution following the UNEA, the United Nations Environmental Assembly Resolution to address soil pollution. That day, uh, Director General, we committed to produce a global assessment on this very important topic that is affecting all of us. And uh, we are so proud to be here today together with our sister agency, UNEP, um, uh, presenting the result of the assessment. Following up on the, on the important uh, 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 of having uh, soil pollution addressed on the ground, I'm very honored to invite uh, His Excellency, Senor David Choquehuanca, Vice Presidente de la, de les, de la Repu, del Estado Plurinacional de Bolivia, para dirigirnos unas palabras desde eh, Bolivia. Excelencia, es un honor pasarle la palabra. Usted es muy bienvenido. Aruski pase pañana casa que punera quispawa. Obligación de dialogar, obligación de comunicarnos. Es un código de la cultura de la vida que se ha resistido durante más de 500 años. Por milenios, los pueblos de la Vía Yala, los pueblos originarios, 
los pueblos indígenas, las culturas milenarias, vivimos y producimos una cultura en consonancia con la vida, escuchando a la vida, escuchando a la tierra, sintiendo el latir de los glaciares, escuchando el rugir del jaguar de la selva verde, dialogando con el abuelo fuego, con el agua, con nuestras montañas, mediante nuestras ceremonias ancestrales. Nunca nos hemos alejado de nuestra madre tierra. Seguimos caminando con respeto al agua, con respeto al abuelo fuego, con respeto a nuestras montañas, con respeto a las plantas, con respeto a las abejas, con respeto al tajpacha, todo lo que existe. Todo lo que sabemos, aprendemos de la naturaleza. Ella nos enseña a cuidar la vida. Por eso lo llamamos Pachamama, es decir, Madre Tierra. Porque ella es la que nos cuida, nos enseña, sostiene y nos alimenta. Aprendimos de ella a vivir en complementariedad, consenso, equilibrio y en, y en armonía sin violentar las leyes de la naturaleza. Hoy, como consecuencia de la implementación de las leyes hechas por el hombre, la modernidad es un modelo de desarrollo occidental capitalista, el mundo, nuestra madre tierra, está al borde del colapso global. Todo está en riesgo, todo está en peligro. Nuestros ríos, océanos, glaciares, montañas, los bosques, las plantas, las aves, las abejas, todo está en riesgo. La vida está en riesgo. Hablar del suelo hoy es hablar de cómo los ciclos vitales del planeta que dieron origen a la vida están siendo alterados por los seres humanos, que en su ambición desmedida están provocando las condiciones para una catástrofe. Es cierto que no todos tenemos la misma responsabilidad en el colapso que se avecina. Los desames petroleros, la contaminación minera, la producción de agrotóxicos que contaminan los suelos y matan a las abejas son provocadas por un puñado de transnacionales y bancos que anteponen sus ganancias a la vida. No hay duda de que el capitalismo nos está llevando a mercantilizar y saquear la naturaleza al extremo de destruir nuestro propio hogar, dejando ruinas y más ruinas todos los días. Pero no todo está perdido. Es tiempo de volver al camino del respeto a la madre tierra. Volver a ser jiwasa. Jiwasa es otro código que, han, que se ha resistido al occidente. Jiwasa no soy yo, somos nosotros. Jiwasa es la muerte del egocentrismo. Jiwasa es la muerte del antropocentrismo y del eurocentrismo. Y cuando hablamos de nosotros... <coughs> No solo hablamos de los seres humanos, hablamos de, de, de todos los seres, de todos los que nos alimentamos con la leche de la madre tierra, que es el agua. Los seres humanos nos alimentamos con la leche de la madre tierra, que es el agua. Las plantas se alimentan con la leche de la madre tierra, que es el agua. Los animales se alimentan de la leche de la madre tierra, que es el agua. Somos hermanos. Somos criados de la Pachamama. O volver a, a ser Kumara es otro código. Kumara significa vida sana, significa suelo sano, significa aire sano, significa agua sana. Los seres humanos necesitamos salir de nuestro enclaustramiento, del antropoceno, y despertar nuestra cabana, mirar más allá de lo que nuestros ojos ven. 
mirar desde nuestros corazones, mirarnos hacia adentro, mirar desde nuestras montañas, desde nuestras plantas. Trascender la hegemonía de la lógica mercantilista del occidente y reencontrar la trialéctica de nuestros ancestros, consistente en equilibrio, complementariedad y armonía. Sabemos que el retorno a la cultura de la vida, de la hermandad, el retorno la, al camino de la verdad, está cerca. Por eso hablamos del código Pachacuti. Pacha, garantizar equilibrios en todo tiempo y espacio. Cuti, retorno. Necesitamos volver al camino del equilibrio. Por todo ello, insistimos en proponer a la Asamblea General de las Naciones Unidas convoque a una Asamblea de la Tierra para que los gobiernos y los pueblos del mundo discutamos todas estas crisis, la crisis ambiental, energética, sanitaria, alimentaria, institucional. Discutamos la vida desde una perspectiva no antropocéntrica y trabajar la defensa de los derechos de la madre tierra. Convocamos a abrazar la vida, convocamos a abrazar la hermandad, la inclusión, la complementariedad, la unidad, la armonía. Convocamos a abrazar la paz y superar el capitalismo, superar el racismo, el egocentrismo, el antropocentrismo, el colonialismo, el patriarcado, que son las causantes de la destrucción de nuestra madre tierra. Construyamos juntos un nuevo horizonte civilizatorio, un nuevo horizonte de vida que nos permita restablecer el equilibrio del planeta, restablecer el equilibrio de nuestra madre tierra, de nuestra Pachamama. Porque Pachamama no solo es madre tierra, Pacha, garantizar equilibrios en todo tiempo y espacio. Mama, madre. Pachamama es madre tierra, no enferma. Pachamama es madre tierra en equilibrio. Escuchemos el llanto de dolor de nuestros bosques, ríos, montañas, abejas, aves, y despertemos la energía comunal para salvar a nuestros hijos y los hijos de nuestros hijos y forjemos el camino del reencuentro con nuestra Pachamama, el reencuentro con la vida, con la felicidad. Jayaya, nuestra madre tierra. Muchísimas gracias, don David, por su emocionante discurso, sus palabras tan inspiradoras eh, sobre la necesidad del respeto a la Pachamama y a su leche, el agua. Realmente, palabras que nos emocionan mucho. We are very honored to have you here, sir. It was uh, impressive uh, and uh, touching. Uh, your, your speech, we are about to reach 900 participants that have been attentively hearing you. I think it paid off for the fact that you are very early in the morning. I understand it's 6 a.m. in La Paz and you decided to be live with us to participate in this meeting. Very honored. Um, continuing with the opening session of this webinar, it's my pleasure to invite the executive director, executive Sec director of the United Nations Environment Program, Dr. Inger Anderson, to uh, speak to us on the importance of this event in the framework of soil pollution, of pollution in general, and the celebration of the World Environment Day. Dr. Anderson, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And like you, let me just... Uh, extend greetings to His Excellency David uh, Chukahankua for his extraordinary remarks and his, uh, the way in which he conveyed the importance of looking after Mother Earth. Indeed, I could not agree with you more, Excellency, that indeed it is humanity's toxic trail 
it is humanity's uh, destruction of our world that has led us to the situation where we are today facing these crises of enormous proportion. And I thank you for the way in which you conveyed them. Let me also thank my dear brother, uh, Director General Ju Zhang Xu, uh, the head of FAO for his remarks. Um, look, this report comes out uh, amid a time of these terrifying planetary crises that we've just heard His Excellency speak to. The crisis of climate change, the crisis of biodiversity, and the crisis of nature loss and the crisis of pollution and waste. That triple crisis of climate, biodiversity, and pollution threatens human health, threatens our well-being, our equality, and our peace. But it also comes out as we embark on the most ambitious effort that we have ever done to do something about that triple crisis. And here I am referring to the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration because we understand that this decade is a great opportunity to change course, a great opportunity to mobilize that global movement to halt, to reverse, and to repair the damage that humanity has caused to the natural world, a great opportunity to deliver on the sustainable development goals, to slow climate change, and to buy time to decarbonize our economies and our societies. As an international community, we must deliver on our commitments to protect and restore ecosystems during this decade. And backing healthy and productive soils must be the foundational element to the decade for so many reasons. Over 90% of our food comes from the soil. It is that Pachamama that delivers us our well being. It stores also more carbon than the atmosphere and all over the world's vegetation combined. It holds incredible biodiversity from worms to microbes uh, and that maintain soil fertility. And overall, soil biodiversity and soil carbon contribute an amazing amount of effort as well as, as financial contribution to the ecosystems services that we get globally every year. So yes, it's so easy to take soil for granted. It's dirt, it's sand, it is just there. It is beneath our feet, feet. it is in our fields, in our gardens, our window boxes. And taking that for garden, maybe for granted, maybe most people assume that it is endless and indestructible. But this report, as has just been summarized by Dr. Chu, tells us something else. The restoration decade has to focus on addressing the pollution of the soil ecosystem for the sake of our own, yes, but also for the sake of our planet, that Pachamama. So how do we do this? Well, let me lay out some actions in four areas, largely drawing from the report and from UNEP's Framework for a Pollution-Free Planet. First. And this is so blindingly obvious, we have to stop the pollution. None of us would pour a cocktail of toxic chemicals into a, pot, plot, a, a potted plant and then eat the tomatoes that we grew from there for dinner, if we grew anything at all. Yet that is what we're doing on a global scale in mining, in industry, in waste, in unsustainable agricultural practices, we are poisoning the soils and so ourselves. It has to stop. We can start in agriculture by adopting sustainable practices such as integrated pest management guidelines for more efficient use uh, of and, and more efficient use of fertilizers and environmentally friendly pesticides. Ahead of the World Food Summit, System Summit, we should be thinking about more diverse and regenerative cropping systems, systems that accommodate healthy crop rotation and enable more diverse diets will reduce the pressure on the soil and allow for degraded and polluted soil to recover in a productive way. We can stop uncontrolled dumping and deal with pollutants before they start leaking. We can invest in long-term environmental monitoring following industrial closures. And we can ensure that people have the rights defended under the law to call out those who transgress, those who pollute, 
uh, to uh, have the full justice of the law come after them. At the systemic level, we can accelerate the transition to sustainable consumption and production so that we can reduce that which goes into the soil in terms of pollution. Applying these basic principles of circularity and resource efficiency, reduce, reuse, recycle, repurpose, repair, will protect our soil and ease the triple planetary crisis. So that's the first point. We can just stop the pollution. The second thing is we have to reverse the damage we've already done to clean up contaminated sites for the health of local communities, for the health of Pachamama, to allow the land to deliver ecosystem services, to free up land for sustainable agriculture production, preventing the need for further conversion of untouched land. But we have to do the cleanup the right way. There is a nursery rhyme, at least in the English language, uh, in which an old lady who swallows a fly try to fix the problem by swallowing a spider, and then she swallows a bird, and increasingly every creature that she swallows is a larger creature. And it doesn't end well, as you can imagine, in the nursery rhyme. So cleaning up sites mechanically or by using chemicals is like that lady swallowing an ever-increasing creature, because that poses similar risks in eliminating the contaminant we can cause bigger ecosystem damage. And that is why nature-based soil remediation techniques are so important, as the report shows. There are many different plants and organisms that can eliminate pollutants and restore the soil balance. Given our need to live in harmony with nature, this is where our focus should be on. And let us be clear, let the polluters pay. This is a basic principles that our parents taught us and parents today teach their children. You make a mess, you clean it up you're responsible. So that's my second point. My third uh, point is very closely linked to the prior. We need much stronger enforcement. While harmful soil contaminants are regulated by global conventions, such as the Basel, the Stockholm, and the Rotterdam conventions, and the Minamata conventions that we in UNEP proudly host. There are many places, they are in many places supplemented by regional agreements and by national laws. These conventions have achieved much, but could do more with stronger implementation and coordination. Equally, countries that are not parties to these conventions should be strongly encouraged to bring them into force and to apply all necessary resources. And we also need a stronger push, as I mentioned, on law and enforcement through the courts and protecting environmental defenders and so that they are not persecuted, but rather that they are protected and listened to under the law. This is increasingly happening. We saw just last week, a Dutch court ordered a major oil company to slash emissions by 2030. And my final point, we need to make sure that the science travels. What we know need to be out there. This report strengthens the science in soil pollution. Now we need to make sure that it gets to the right people, not just to politicians and scientists, to farmers, to businesses, to consumers, to law enforcement officers. We need everyone to understand that healthy soils mean healthy people and a healthy planet. So as we launch the UN Decade on Restoration, we must ensure that everybody does what they can to ensure soil health through halting and reversing pollution. And that will be essential for the success of this decade, the sustainable development goals, the coming new biodiversity framework, and at the end, the very future of humanity. We at UNEP thank our partners at the FAO for their valuable partnership as we take this to action, to the front line, this crucial issue to look forward. And we look forward to a long and successful collaboration where we all seek solutions to soil pollution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inger, uh, for the outstanding speech and very visual when you describe the four steps uh, towards addressing pollution and soil pollution. Uh, I, I, every, every, you can't imagine the number, amount of chat message that came in support of your speech here. Uh, we are reaching a thousand participants listening to us live uh, at this very moment. Uh, and uh, it was very clear that without healthy soils, we are not having healthy foods. And without health, healthy foods, we are not having healthy lives. And healthy lives are the best um, defense we have against 
uh, the different threats we are facing, including the pandemic that we are facing. We cannot close this uh, launching event without listening from our colleagues of the sister agency World Health Organization. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the Director of Environment, Climate Change and Health of uh, WHO, uh, Maria Neira, was not available at this time to come to us, but she took the trouble to record a video and she sent the message to us through a video. So let me welcome you to see the video of Dr. Neira from WHO on uh, soil pollution and health. Um, colleagues from the, the, the GSP that have the techniques, can you please launch the video of Dr. Neira? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues from FAO and UNEP, thank you very much for this opportunity. We are very happy to share with you a moment of this important event. You know, for, for the World Health Organization, but for the uh, health community at large, zero pollution means 100 health. And therefore, it's extremely important what you are discussing here today and will have a very uh, a positive or negative impact on our health if the right decision or the wrong ones are taken. Many governments are at the moment allocating very important financial resources for the recovery after COVID-19. And we need to make sure that those investments are going into the right direction to protect people's health, to make sure that we will have a healthy and green and fair recovery, since we know many of the causes that took us where we are now. And one of those causes is the fact that we have been polluting our soil, polluting our air, polluting our water and obviously you will agree with me that this doesn't represent a very strong pillar if we want to maintain the, the health of the people. We learned that uh, fighting against uh, any infectious uh, agent, emerging infectious agent like uh, SARS-CoV-2 means fighting the virus and developing vaccines and diagnosis and treatment but it means as well going upstream and understanding what's happened. And now we know that one of the reasons where we are much more vulnerable and where the new emerging infectious agents can, can break that uh, barrier between the animal species and human species is because we have been treating our nature on a very bad way. We have been destroying and polluting everything we touch. We have been destroying biodiversity. We have been uh, practicing very aggressive agricultural uh, uh, methods and sometimes even very polluting ones. And therefore we are putting at risk and, and increasing the vulnerability for human health, of course, animal health as well, and environmental health. This approach now of one health is very attractive. We have been promoting this concept and working on this concept for many years now and, and, and FAO is one of the strong partners on this uh, tripartite agreement for, for One Health. But we need to reinforce this concept of the interlinkages between not only animal health and human health but as well how much we are linked and how much we depend on nature and all the resources that we need for our health are coming from nature. And therefore, we are very happy that um, our manifesto for healthy and green recovery containing six prescriptions is very much uh, accepted by many because it's in fact a question of uh, common sense investments. And one of the prescriptions under the manifesto is exactly that. We need to make sure that we have very sustainable food systems. We do not pollute our soil, we do not put at risk the, the, the healthy diets, the, the, the nutrition, the food that we need, we need for our population, and again, don't polluting everything we touch. There is no limit for, for, for ambition on public health, and for us, what you are doing uh, today at this important meeting is part of our agenda on public health, as it is the climate change negotiations and the COP, we know that if we tackle the causes of climate change, there will be enormous benefits on, benefits on reducing air pollution. And by doing so, we will benefit enormously and reduce the number of deaths caused by exposure to air pollution. Similar soil pollution, we know how much we depend on, 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 on agricultural practices, on, on, on the way we will treat our resources and therefore 
I, I, I know that the conclusions of this important report that you are launching today are very much linked to the health of our people. I thank you once again for this opportunity. I trust that uh, you will be very successful. And on behalf of WHO, thank you very much. And, and uh, we keep certainly strongly collaborating, all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the colleagues in the WHO for sending the message of Dr. Neda and her inspiring words, her reference to the, our joint work under the One Health. And uh, we are, as I mentioned, about to reach a thousand participants. And uh, some questions are popping up. I'm very happy to see them in the Q&A part of the, the session. Some of them are, I haven't seen the report you're talking about. We are here for a launch of a report. Where is it? Don't worry, we are exactly teasing your interest. It took us three years from the Symposium on Global Soil Pollution uh, in, in May 2018 to today to produce the report. I'm privileged to have here one copy and soon you're gonna have it online. We are being paper smart. The publication hard copy is only a summary for policymakers, 60 pages. The whole set of documents will be available online and it's free. Uh, and I'm gonna introduce it to you now through my colleagues. They have uh, prepared a nice video on position in the issue of soil pollution. And immediately after, a colleague from the Global Soil Partnership will present the report. And that's the moment that the report will come live on the link that we are going to provide to you in the chat and on the different uh, social media um, um, tools that uh, are being used here. Please, uh, my, my, my other colleague, uh, uh, Isabella, already put in the chat the hashtag uh, Stop Soil Pollution. Uh, for us to adhere, if you want to help us promote this event, promote the end of soil pollution, and promote the celebration of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration and the World Environment Day. Uh, again, from the colleagues of the, the, the organization of the event, can you please launch the video on soil pollution that will pre-introduce the report? Thank you. Soil pollution, a hidden reality. Beneath our feet lurks a hidden danger, soil pollution. Soil pollution can be invisible and seems far away, but everyone is affected. Soil pollution is a worldwide problem which degrades our soils, poisons the food we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe, posing a serious risk to food security, human health, and the environment. Soils have a great potential to filter and buffer contaminants, degrading and attenuating the negative effects of pollutants. But this capacity is finite. Most of the pollutants originate from human activities, such as unsustainable farming practices, industrial activity and mining, untreated urban waste, and other non-environmental friendly practices. As technology evolves, scientists are able to identify previously undetected pollutants. But at the same time, these technological improvements lead to new contaminants being released into the environment. The Sustainable Development Goals 2, 3, 12 and 15 have targets which command direct consideration of soil resources, especially soil pollution and degradation, in relation to food security. The consensus achieved on the Declaration on Soil Pollution during the last UN Environment Assembly is a clear sign of global determination to tackle pollution and its causes. It is time to uncover this threatening reality. Combating soil pollution requires us to join forces and turn determination into action. It is the time to fight soil pollution be the solution to soil pollution. I hope you have enjoyed this uh, uh, video as much as I did. And uh, I think it's a good juncture, a juncture for me to recognize the, the support that we received for the Global Symposium on Soil Pollution and uh, for the publication of the report from the, the the Minister of Finance of the Russian Federation, the Minister of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality of the Netherlands, the European Commission, the Swiss Federation, Confederation, 
the, from the Minister of uh, Europe and the Foreign Affairs of the government of France. Uh, without their support, we would not be able to produce the information that is here. How this information has been generated? We had a colleague that we hired uh, uh, just before the symposium to help us put up the symposium. And uh, she organized it, everything. A young professional doctor uh, from uh, now working with us in the Global Soil Partnership until that time, Dr. Natalia Rodriguez. I am uh, very honored to, to welcome you to present uh, the uh, report, Global Assessment of Soil Pollution that has been done since uh, the symposium. Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eduardo. And um, thank you, Excellencies, for such an inspiring words. It has been really nice to listen to you. Allow me to share my screen. Okay. So thank you again, Excellencies, dear participants. It is a great honor for me indeed to launch this report today because it has been a long process and we are very proud to have it. Uh, ready. So please allow me to do so in Spanish. Okay. En 2015, la FAO y el Grupo Técnico Intergubernamental de Suelos lanzaron el informe sobre la situación de los recursos del suelo en el mundo. Este representa la primera evaluación mundial del estado de los suelos y de las principales amenazas para el funcionamiento del suelo, en que la contaminación se, se identifica como una de ellas. Sin embargo, ponía de manifiesto que la información sobre la contaminación del suelo no estaba disponible en todas las regiones y cuando existía estaba muy fragmentada y sin armonizar. Los estudios sobre la contaminación del suelo se han disparado desde entonces, permitiéndonos tener una imagen más amplia, pero aún incompleta. En 2017 se produce un hito muy importante en la comunidad internacional, ya que los ministerios de medio ambiente de 173 países firman la resolución de la UNEA 3, en la que se afirma que la contaminación del suelo debe abordarse si se quiere alcanzar la Agenda 2030 de Desarrollo Sostenible. Paralelamente, la FAO y, el, y la Alianza Mundial por el Suelo organizan el Simposio Mundial sobre la Contaminación del Suelo de la mano con eh, la, la, el Programa de las Naciones Unidas para el Medio Ambiente, la Organización Mundial de la Salud y la eh, Secretaría de las Convenciones eh, sobre Químicos. Este simposio trajo de la mano a todos los expertos para poner la información más actualizada sobre la mesa y para la búsqueda de soluciones. Y estas soluciones quedaron plasmadas en el documento Ser la solución a la contaminación del suelo, que estableció nuestra agenda de acción. En respuesta a la UNEA 3 y al documento sobre la contaminación del suelo, la Alianza Mundial por el Suelo, de la mano de, de UNEP o, o del PENUMA, es, prepararon o iniciaron la preparación de este informe que estamos lanzando hoy. Ha sido un largo proceso en el que se identificaron muchos expertos para contribuir, se llevaron a cabo eh, discusiones abiertas, se revisó información y hubo también un proceso de redacción y revisión por pares del informe. Más de 200 expertos han participado de un modo u otro en la elaboración de este informe y aprovecho esta oportunidad para agradecer a cada uno de ellos por el apoyo prestado y en especial a mi colega, eh, a mi contraparte en el, en el PENUMA, Abdelkader Benzada. El informe se divide en 14 capítulos y presenta información sobre los principales contaminantes del suelo, describe también las principales fuentes de contaminación del suelo, tanto naturales como antrópicas, los impactos en la salud humana, ambiental y socioeconómicos. También incluye una evaluación de la situación regional que mis colegas presentarán a continuación y resume algunas de las mejores técnicas disponibles para la gestión y la remediación de suelos contaminados, incluidas soluciones basadas en la naturaleza. Y ofrece por último un camino a seguir para abordar eficazmente la contaminación del suelo a nivel mundial. El informe está ya disponible en línea y mis colegas van a poner este enlace que ustedes ven aquí en mi presentación en el chat para que lo puedan consultar. Uno de los principales eh, resultados de este informe es la sólida evidencia que hemos encontrado 
de que la contaminación del suelo supone una gran amenaza para la consecución de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Es especialmente importante para el nexo pobreza, alimentación y salud, ya que la contaminación del suelo reduce el rendimiento, la seguridad y la calidad de las cosechas, lo que conlleva a una reducción de los ingresos de las poblaciones rurales y golpea más duramente a los más vulnerables. Por ponerles algunos datos, pues alrededor del 79% de las personas que viven en condiciones de extrema pobreza lo hacen en zonas rurales y dependen en gran medida de la agricultura para su subsistencia. Pero ¿qué ocurre? Que la contaminación del suelo es responsable de una pérdida de productividad agrícola de entre el 15 y el 25%, aunque se han registrado valores aún más altos, como en el caso de Ghana, donde la contaminación del suelo producida por una zona minera cercana redujo una productividad del 40% en tan solo 8 años. La Organización Mundial de la Salud calcula que alrededor del 16% de la mortalidad total mundial se atribuye a enfermedades relacionadas con la contaminación ambiental, incluida del agua, del aire y del suelo. Y se concentra en su mayoría en los países menos desarrollados. Sin embargo, la carga de enfermedad que podemos atribuir únicamente a la contaminación del suelo sigue siendo en gran medida desconocida y podría estar seriamente subestimada. La contaminación del suelo también afecta a la calidad del agua, la lixiviación de contaminantes o la movilización de nutrientes por escorrentía conducen a la contaminación de las aguas superficiales y a la eutrofización de arroyos y de océanos. El coste anual de eliminar esos contaminantes, tanto nitratos, fosfatos, plaguicidas como patógenos, para cumplir con las normas de agua y restaurar ecológicamente estas zonas afectadas por eutrofización asciende a miles de millones de dólares al año. El transporte y la mala gestión de los residuos son dos de las principales causas de la contaminación del suelo en las zonas urbanas, donde vive el 55% de la población mundial. Los espacios verdes urbanos representan grandes oportunidades para nuestro desarrollo personal, social, para nuestra salud y para nuestro bienestar. Pero si se contaminan, serán una vía más de exposición a la contaminación del suelo poniendo en riesgo también a ese 55%. La contaminación del suelo supone también una seria amenaza para el medio ambiente. En 2018 se aplicaron unos 109 millones de toneladas de fertilizantes sintéticos nitrogenados en todo el mundo. El exceso de nitrógeno en los suelos se libera a la atmósfera en forma de óxido nitroso, lo que provoca emisiones de unos 700.000 equivalentes de dióxido de carbono, acelerando el cambio climático y contrarrestando cualquier esfuerzo que estemos haciendo contra él. Además, alrededor del 80% de la contaminación marina procede de actividades terrestres. Los plásticos, los nutrientes y los contaminantes químicos orgánicos son los principales contaminantes del suelo que causan un rápido deterioro de los ecosistemas marinos. La contaminación del suelo provoca también una reacción en cadena en los ecosistemas terrestres y produce una grave alteración del funcionamiento de las poblaciones. Los contaminantes del suelo se transfieren a la cadena alimentaria hasta llegar a los seres humanos, produciendo la contaminación y degradación de ecosistemas enteros. Pero a pesar de todos los esfuerzos realizados hasta la fecha, aún quedan algunos aspectos por conocer. Nuestra comprensión de las interacciones entre los múltiples contaminantes que se encuentran en los suelos y su efecto combinado sobre los organismos es aún escaso. Y esto se ve agravado por la aparición de nuevos contaminantes sobre los que la información disponible es muy limitada. Este informe constata lo que ya se vislumbraba en 2015, que la contaminación del suelo es una de las principales amenazas para los suelos del mundo y pone en peligro la prestación de, de servicios ecosistémicos clave, como el suministro de alimentos inocuos y nutritivos, la disponibilidad de agua limpia y la conservación de la biodiversidad del suelo. Los contaminantes presentes en el suelo afectan a prácticamente todos los, nuestros órganos, causando múltiples enfermedades e incluso la muerte. La salud de los ecosistemas y la salud humana, por tanto, están interconectadas y el suelo actúa como nexo para todas ellas. Por tanto, como bien decía nuestra colega de la OMS, el suelo debe estar y debe ser considerado como punto clave en la estrategia Una Sola Salud o One Health ya que esta no puede abordarse de forma efectiva sin atajar antes la contaminación del suelo. El informe pone también de manifiesto que las actividades industriales, la minería, la mala gestión de los residuos, la agricultura insostenible 
la extracción y procesamiento de combustibles fósiles y el transporte son las principales fuentes de contaminación del suelo. Y además se espera que la contaminación del suelo vaya en aumento, a no ser que, produ que se produzca un rápido cambio en las pautas de producción y consumo hacia una economía más verde y circular. Además, los marcos normativos y legislativos son claves en este cambio hacia una economía circular y la aplicación global del principio de quién contamina paga es fundamental para prevenir y reducir los daños. Por tanto, hay que instar a todos los países a poner este principio en práctica. Junto con el cambio climático, la contaminación ambiental y en especial la contaminación del suelo es uno de los principales retos globales a los que nos enfrentamos hoy en día como humanidad. Y es un problema transfronterizo que requiere acciones globales coordinadas. Si queremos garantizar la identificación, gestión y remediación de los suelos contaminados, así como la adopción de medidas preventivas, es necesario reforzar los canales de comunicación entre la academia, los responsables políticos y la sociedad. Esto garantizará que todas las partes interesadas dispongan de información oportuna y con base científica sobre las posibles amenazas que plantea la contaminación del suelo y puedan así tomar decisiones con conocimiento de causa. Y para terminar, les presento nuestra propuesta de camino a seguir, basada en las pruebas científicas reunidas para este informe, así como la opinión de expertos que han participado en diferentes foros de la Alianza Mundial por el Suelo y del Programa de las Naciones Unidas para el Medio Ambiente, que pueden resumirse en cuatro puntos clave. En primer lugar, debemos mejorar el conocimiento sobre la contaminación del suelo, desde la identificación y la cartografía hasta el seguimiento. Y para ello queremos proponer la creación del Sistema Mundial de Vigilancia e Información sobre la Contaminación del Suelo, de forma que podamos apoyar a los países en la recogida de datos e información armonizado. Queremos también reforzar los marcos legislativos y las acciones técnicas, pues sin ellos nada puede ser eh, llevado a cabo. Y debemos abogar por un compromiso global para prevenir, detener y remediar la contaminación del suelo en el marco, como se ya ha mencionado, de ambiciones como la contaminación cero o hacia un planeta libre de contaminación. Aprovechando también esfuerzos y objetivos regionales, como puede ser el Pacto Verde Europeo. Debemos mejorar la concienciación y la comunicación mediante una campaña de sensibilización global y promoción de un consumo responsable y respetuoso con el medio ambiente serán parte clave de nuestras acciones. Debemos fomentar una economía circular poniendo especial énfasis en las cuatro R, reducir, reutilizar, reciclar y recuperar. Y por último, debemos fomentar la cooperación internacional, facilitar la transferencia de conocimientos científicos en, de, en medios abiertos a todo el público y abogar por la transferencia de tecnología y la creación de capacidades cruzadas para todo el ciclo de la contaminación del suelo. La Alianza Mundial por el Suelo y el Programa de las Naciones Unidas para el Medio Ambiente están listas para avanzar esta agenda global sobre la contaminación del suelo, en colaboración con todos aquellos interesados, y así lograr entre todos un mundo con cero contaminación. Y para concluir, me gustaría terminar mi presentación con esta reflexión, ya que hoy también celebramos el lanzamiento de la década de, la década de restauración de los ecosistemas. As we strive to restore 350 million hectares of land in the framework of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, we cannot neglect the role of healthy soils. To restore world ecosystems, we must address soil pollution and restore soil health and ecosystem services it supports. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Muchísimas gracias, Natalia. Again, uh, when we are here, over a thousand participants attending. Uh, we can, you can imagine during the presentation, the number of chats, questions that popped up, including on the, the um, how to get the report, because now it's out there, you saw it in the chat. It's available for, for online reading. We are trying to be as much paper smart as we can. We encourage you to use it electronically. Uh, but uh, my colleagues will confirm to me if it will be available for downloading in the PDF format as well. I will get the answer to you in a minute. Um, I have some, uh, yes, uh, also some comments in terms of the fact that Natalia spoke in Spanish, reminding you that the interpretation is available in the three languages. Please access it uh, when you need. Um, 
Most of our presenters, and especially the Director General of FAO and the Executive Director of UNEP, uh, mentioned to us the importance of acting on the ground. Yes, we are celebrating today, uh, anticipated the launching of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration in the World Environment Day 5 June, which celebrated tomorrow. But we have to look at um, how we are going to do to address soil pollution, to be the solution to soil pollution, to stop soil pollution. And that happens on the ground. That happens uh, in, the, in, the, in the countries, with the farmers, with the, the people that are, have direct interaction with it. So that's why we decided to invite uh, seven colleagues from different regions to speak to us what's the situation of uh, what's the status of soil pollution at their regions. Uh, this report that you are reading today is the, the production of uh, uh, Natalia amongst 53 authors that have engaged in the result. We would like to have your feedback that we will pass to all of them. We are firm believers that actions are on the ground and that no one has the solution alone. So we have to work together on this. And it's my pleasure and my honor to invite the first speaker from the University of Newcastle in Australia, evening there, uh, speaking about the soil pollution status in Asia Pacific, Dr. Ravi Naidu. Ravi, are you with us? Can I see you? Thank you so much. You may unmute. I see you mute. Unmute your mic, please. And the floor is now. now. Thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen. Ravi, please, uh, no more than five minutes. We have seven speakers from seven regions in the world, okay? Okay, yes. You may put it in presentation mode. It was there, it's not anymore. Uh, yes, I'm just uh, trying to figure out where it is. Yeah. We are seeing it now. Can you see it now? Yes, but put in presentation mode. Okay. Just click there in the presentation mode. It, it is presentation mode. I just wonder why we don't see that. Okay, you may move ahead. For a question of time, just scroll through this. I think we can see this. Okay, thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Eduardo. And my sincere apologies. I wonder why it is not in presentation mode. Uh, thank you very much, Eduardo. And I also want to thank uh, FAO, the team. Um, uh, this is an absolutely outstanding piece of work. And we thank the team for inviting us um, to, to come up with the report on global assessment of soil pollution for the Asia Pacific region. Uh, this report that we have, um, uh, the focus of this, as I mentioned, is Asia Pacific, uh, led by myself and Dr. Bishwas, along with a team of contributors from a number of countries, uh, Professor Chen, uh, Dr. Jit, uh, Rahman, uh, Dr. Duan, Kim Lee, uh, Fenaret uh, Khan, and Vijay Vardhana, from, all from different countries in the Asia Pacific region. What is important to note is that Asia Pacific region brings a lot of diversity on a number of fronts. On the one hand, when you look at the economic status of these countries, they vary considerably between from country to country. The business activities vary, the consumer lifestyles vary, and therefore the policies that they have could, can also vary. And as a consequence of that, there are huge differences in the appreciation of sustainable development. When you just look at the economic status of this country, if you look at the figure on the right-hand side, we have the majority of the, these countries in the low to upper middle income categories. And these are the ones that are painted blue and, and uh, deep blue. Uh, we have lower medical income countries, quite a number of them. Uh, and uh, we have middle income countries, quite large. So if you look at China over here, for instance, and then a couple of countries that are classed as high income countries. The very fact that the lower and middle income countries are aspiring uh, to develop and also grow the economies, there's a huge push 
towards industrial development as well, because it provides jobs. As a consequence of this, there, if you look at the extent and severity of environmental contamination, it can vary quite a lot depending on what country you're looking, looking at, going from New Zealand, Australia, all the way to, to Asian countries as well. The sources of pollution that you see in these countries, it could be natural and also it could be human made. When you look at natural, irrespective of which country you go to, you, we always have naturally occurring contaminants. An example, for instance, arsenic, this was always present there, but human activities that have exposed this. And, and now we have very large areas of, of uh, land contaminated with arsenic through irrigation using water that was arsenic contaminated. New Zealand, on the other hand, eruptions have led to diffuse contamination with mercury and some of the other heavy, heavy metalloids. Then you also have naturally occurring, for example, bushfires that have led to uh, extensive diffuse contamination from polyamorphic hydrocarbons. As opposed to naturally occurring or geogenic contaminants, when we look at human-made contaminants, the push towards economic, global economy, particularly developing countries wanting to be the same as developed countries, massive increase in industrial activities, including mining, uh, use of agrochemicals, energy production, transport, and solid waste that they generate have led to extensive uh, contamination as well. Just for example, if you like, look at human made mining, uh, Asia Pacific region. Yes, uh, Ravi, we just, we are going to, to show the, the, your slides from here. Okay. And uh, if you can see it now, you can guide and my colleague will be passing them according to okay. what you need. Oh, thank you very much. So, that would be easier for you and for us. Okay, and can you go back please on the slide? One more, yes. So if we just look at uh, mining, for example, coal mining, um, Asia Pacific region produce far more than any other country. And while coal itself might not be seen as a pollutant, but when you burn it, emissions that we generate, when we mine it, the degradation, land degradation, all of these contributes towards the contamination of the environment. Solid waste, every individual, we generate a ton of thousand kilograms of solid waste annually. What do we do with this? Are we able to manage this? The question that we're asking now. And of course, pesticide use. If you look at uh, Asian countries, we use far more than some of the developed countries as well. And that is leading to extensive diffuse contamination of, 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 our, of, our, of our environment. Uh, clearly, we do need policies I'll talk about later to manage this extent and severity of contamination that we see in the region. Next slide, please. Thanks, thank you. Here's one example of paper that was published in 2019. I believe this is an excellent paper by Zeng and his co-authors. And if you look at what they have, what they have published, that 22.1% of China's farmland soil presents a mixture of contaminants. And just on the left-hand side, you can see the number of samples that they took. Not many researchers would do this. Extensive number of samples confirming that 22.1% of China's farmland soil is, 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 is contaminated. 20.8% of the soils are likely to pose a carcinogenic risk to their adult population and an even greater risk to children. So if you look at the left-hand side here again, and then going beyond that, they talk about a number of provinces, Yunnan, Hunan, and Hui Hunan, and Lianong provinces that should be controlled as a priority because of severity and high risks to human health. And this is on the right hand side. Again, an excellent um, uh, reflection of what they are confronted with from pollution perspective. Clean, this is green versus severe contamination, which is red. And, and, and the top one here, A, is a number of polluted areas, uh, large areas as well. Next, please. Next slide. So where are we with regards to legal frameworks uh, addressing soil pollution? pollution? Every country, when you take a survey, they all say that, yes, we have a policy on, on an env environment, but then adherence to the policy seems to be a major challenge. And that's what the countries are saying, that they pledge to tackle waste management, chemical pollution, specific to soil pollution response, which responds varies considerably. 
there is no regional convention on soil protection or soil pollution prevention uh, in the region and controls currently exist uh, that in, exist in the Asia Pacific region. Quite unlike, for example, European Union, in Europe, you do have EU coming together and they work together from, from soil pollution of soil pollution perspectives, plus a whole lot of other environmental policies. When you look at national legal frameworks addressing soil pollution, there are not many countries that have these. Some countries touch on these, but minimum. An example here being uh, Japan Act to prevent soil contamination agricultural land, uh, soil contamination counter, counter measures Act 2002, while Fiji Environmental Management Act 2005 and Rural Land Use Policy of Fiji has some aspects as well. So this is something we not just should visit, but work with these countries to see whether we can have um, a, a, a framework uh, that addresses soil pollution. Can we get to the next, next slide, please? So what are the, some of the key messages? Having reviewed uh, pollution status of the Asia Pacific countries, uh, we note uh, that, um, that many developed countries in the Asia Pacific, they have implemented legislation that, that prevents greater environmental pollution and provides guidance for soil remediation. Uh, that said, in most developing countries in the region, they're st still struggling to cope, to cope with soil pollution, largely because the lack of adherence to any policies that they have. Some of the gaps identified, um, the register of potentially contaminated sites, we don't have that, but then many developed countries don't have that either. A challenge that we face is that we do not have sufficient human resource capacity in the region who are trained to assess, manage, and, and clean up environmental contamination. So we need to build capacity in the region. And hence, contaminant size assessment is weak in the region. There's a lack of appreciation of source receptor pathways and life cycle analysis from contamination perspective. Above all of these, there's a lack of, lack of awareness amongst the people that pollutants uh, do lead to fatalities. That's something which we need to bring to the attention of people as well. Food security and safety issues of, of concern and there's no soil pollution exclu exclusive guidelines. Cutting across all of this, there's no country in the Asia Pacific region that has policy on diffuse pollution. We have policies on site specific pollution, even in Australia, but there's nothing on diffuse, diffuse pollution. So there is a lot of work that we need to do from awareness perspective, working with different countries from policy perspective, and also providing support from training perspective as well. And nothing is possible in some of these countries unless there is financial support as well. Can we get to the next one, please? I don't think. So thank you very much. Um, this is just putting a face to the name of contributors that have contributed towards uh, this report. Wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the outstanding uh, contributions from Dr. Vishwas and rest of the team as well. Eduardo, thank you very much uh, for your patience as well. Thank you, Dr. Naidu. Thank you, Ravi. It's a pleasure to have you with us and to learn so much about the situation in Asia Pacific. Uh, you went a bit over the time, so we have now to put pressure on the next speakers. It was interesting to learn from you. Uh, my next speaker is uh, Ms. Valentina Pidlinisuk from the Young Evangelista Purkine University in Czech Republic. My pronunciation in Czech is awful, but you are most welcome. Valentina, to talk about us, the status of soil pollution in Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. I'm sorry to put pressure on you now, but you have to be binded by the five minutes time that we have all allocated. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for introduction. I will try to keep five minutes. And uh, uh, thank you for possibility to introduce uh, the uh, results of the state with the soil pollution in the, in the countries of uh, uh, Eurasia. And uh, here the main uh, polluters are agriculture and uh, agriculture industry um, followed by uh, chemicals and uh, uh, um, 
mining, oil industry, nuclear activities, urban sprawl, and military activity, activities, former and current. And according to the background of the countries, uh, uh, there are uh, 12 countries of the Soviet Union which represented this region. Depending on the cultural and political differences, geographical location, and socioeconomic uh, background, the region can be divided into three main uh, sub-regions. Eastern European countries, uh, Caucasus uh, republics, and Middle Asian uh, republics. And uh, I will now overview briefly the state of the soil pollution in the region depending on these sub-regions. Uh, the first sub-region is represented by the Ukraine, Russian Federation, Belarus, and Moldova. And the biggest uh, um, uh, soil pollution are caused by the industry, industrial accidents, agriculture, mining, and chemicals. And the biggest concern in the region is contamination by soil after the Chernobyl catastrophe, which happened in 1986. Nevertheless, 35 years past, the situation is still rather serious. The dead zone around the Chernobyl is still dangerous, which is 30 kilometers. And particularly, there are the secondary pollution uh, through the underground water and food chain. And it should be mentioned that uh, according to prognosis, the uh, radioactive elements which released in eight, 1986 uh, are now transferring to americium. This map illustrated the prognosis of the uh, contamination of the region in year 2050. And uh, 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 I want to mention that in 2019, uh, thanks to international uh, foundations, different, uh, the shelter was built over the Chernobyl station, which preserved the release of uh, radioactive elements to the air in case something happened with the destroyed reactor. Uh, the second, uh, the second region is uh, presented uh, by Caucasus Republic. And uh, uh, there are Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. And in this region, uh, the biggest concern are uh, former mining sites and industrial co uh, conflicts abounded after the Soviet area remained the main contributor there, particularly the contamination of the soil and gas industry. Uh, here you may see the um, impact, negative impact to the state of the house in the Apsheron region, which is located close to the Caspian Sea. And thanks to the World Bank support, uh, the ecological rehabilitation of two very polluted sites were done in this region uh, by applying the technology dig and dump. The next region is a region of uh, subregion is a subregion of Central Asian countries, and it is presented by the five countries: Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. And here are the common driver of the uh, soil pollution are the mining, in particular uranium mining, oil and metal sector. And military activities during the Soviet area left a legacy of soil polluted with radionuclides, trace elements, and petroleum products. And particularly very dangerous is the situation in the uh, Sirdarya River and Fergana Valley, which is strongly contaminated by uranium and hazardous waste. And that's why UN resolution called for assistance to remediate this particular territory. It should be mentioned that in Turkmenistan, uh, the, the special program was implemented in 2009-2011, which uh, um, cleaned up uh, 47,000 uh, square meters of territories contaminated by radioactive waste, and they were 
transport, uh, transported and storage in a special storage built in desert. And I want to specifically point the situation with the pops and obsolete pesticides, which is common for all the Eurasian region. And uh, uh, nevertheless, um, a lot of efforts uh, of international foundation, different international foundation organization and support was done for elimination the uh, stockpiles of pops. Uh, nevertheless, the situation is still rather serious, uh, particularly with, in some countries of the Middle Asia, where the access to the information is very weak. However, there are a good deal, deal in this region with this obsolete pesticides in Moldova, Moldova due to number of international projects, uh, some uh, uh, part of the POPs and PCB were packaged, transported and destroyed abroad. Also, the another good example of, is from Kazakhstan, where 80 tons of electrical transformers and capacities were incinerated in France in accordance to the governmental program after 2015. And uh, uh, speaking about gaps generally in the region, this is a weak access to information, knowledge gaps, infrastructure and uh, capacity uh, building ne is necessary here and lack of awareness and political wills. And I want to also present some looking forward activities. Uh, they should be concentrated on improvement of monitoring and reporting, exchange of positive uh, experience in between regions. For example, it could be done with Moldova, which is like a leading country in the region in terms of um, a program related to POPs. Also, a good coordination to, should be done between different projects supported by different organizations, networking with local uh, authorities and public, and particularly important is involvement of the regional experts in order to be successful in implementation. And also what is necessary to do this is technology and uh, knowledge transfer. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Valentina. I was within uh, not five, but like seven minutes. Seven minutes, and yes. But it was so, so fascinating to hear from you. And uh, we know that you are addressing very serious air pollution problems in the region. It's important to see how positive you are looking at the possible solutions for this. Thank you so much. Without further ado, let me invite Mr. Bern. Busian from, uh, from the German, uh, is a retiree from the German Environment Agency, is an expert on the topic. And uh, Bern will, is going to present us the status in Europe. Uh, Bern, the shorter you can make, the more time we'll have for the other colleagues. Thank you. Please open your microphone. You're mute. Okay. Yes, now it's fine. Okay. It's fine? Yes, and we can see your okay. screen. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Buenas tardes. Uh, Buonasera, Kalimera. Bonjour, Merhaba, Huvepeve. Uh, so, you know, uh, Europe is diverse, but not only in languages, also in terms of environmental issues and policies. Oops, sorry, no. Hmm? It stopped. Maybe I can try if the presentation is available here. Isabel can try. Uh, yeah, wait. I, I, whoop. No, I, I restart. Sorry. Hmm. Yeah, try you. Have a try. Isabel has the, the presentation, Bern. She will just put okay, the perfect. slides through. Thank you. So next slide, please. 
Okay, so Europe, uh, Europe comprises uh, 42, uh, 42 countries and uh, so uh, divided into the uh, uh, EU27 uh, uh, European uh, countries which are member of the uh, European Union and we have another 15 non-EU member countries. And the next slide please. And so the total area comprises about 5 million square kilometers and uh, the EU42 uh, have about uh, 640 million people and the uh, total budget for the EU25 is about uh, 13 trillion US dollar. Next slide please. So um, regarding pollution in Europe, so the main uh, issue is uh, that we have to look back at a long industrial history. So and that is a main cause for contaminants. We, uh, so we're talking about mineral oils, we talk about smoke stack industries, we're talking um, about organic contaminants, halogenate and non-halogenate. And so also we have to say we have two 0.8 million sites which are which are suspected to be contaminated. So the second issue is agriculture. That is because about 25% a quarter is covered by acres and forests, and they cause uh, well-known uh, problems. And it's uh, uh, pesticide residues we have to talk about. We have to talk about nitrogen inputs and uh, for, uh, synthetic inputs by synthetic fertilizers, but also uh, regarding uh, in, uh, 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 pollution by manure. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, urban housing. So is the next, urban housing and transport. And uh, the, the thing is that uh, most of the popul European population is living in cities and they cause many environmental problems and problems regarding soil pollution. Um, uh, then mining activities, which is in some regions uh, uh, located in Europe, we have changes definitely in the last gen centuries. That is in Central Europe, we have less mining, we have almost no smokestack industry that, that went to Asia. So Ravi just told about, and last but not least, we still suffer problems due to military activities and arms manufacturing industry. So next slide, please. So uh, mapping and monitoring, what do we know about soil pollution in Europe? So um, we have uh, regarding chemical background, we do have three systems. One is a forex, which is basically uh, uh, focusing on the geogenic input by elements. And um, then we do, uh, uh, where about less than 1,000 sampling locations uh, have been uh, investigated. Then we do have the GMS program and the Lucas program or, uh, project. Both are in collaboration with the EU uh, uh, Commission and joint research centers. The most uh, sampling points does have LUCA, so Land Use and Coverage Area Frame Survey, which is not only looking at agricultural sampling locations, but also on the whole land cover. And so it has almost 22,000 sampling locations and different land uses uh, under investigation. So next slide, please. Uh, what are the good news? We do have accurate data to determine the geochemical background for elements. Uh, and we have all satisfying data uh, to make detailed assessments and uh, to identify polluted sites. Uh, what are the bad news? The bad news is that we do not have European-wide data on non-metal pollutants, specifically on uh, organic pollutants like pesticides, agrochemicals, emerging compounds and personal care products, plastics and so on. So that means as the recommendation develop and strengthen the inventory. That's what we really have to do in Europe from a, a, a European wide perspective. Next slide, please. 
And uh, what about soil policy? We have to look back, or we are going, uh, we are looking back to a history of 70 years. Already in the 50s, we started with uh, um, uh, Europe, with the European Soil Survey, uh, or uh, European Soil Survey organization started to look at soils, and we have a European Soil Charter from the 70s. We uh, did have, uh, at the end of the last century, uh, we started with, with the European Soil Forum and with European uh, 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 policy actions. Uh, what we, next slide, please. What we do have in Europe is a soil semantic strategy. We're still working on that, uh, but we do not have a so common soil legislation since uh, about, 35 different level, EU level policies exist which tackle soil issues. And uh, uh, we, have about 13, we have 13 EU directives which tackle soil issues. And we have uh, more than 600 national policies, but what we do not have is common, uh, common uh, legislation. Next slide, please. Uh, what's the way forward? First, we are working on the soil symmetric strategy, and we do have it. And uh, we had a, a, a and second issue is uh, the Green Deal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, where the Green Deal in its strategies uh, on several uh, um, uh, and several strategies, soil is tackled and. Go forward with uh, clicking the next slide, please. And uh, soil pollution is uh, tackled in strategy 216 and several places. Next, please. In the strategy 217, preserving and restoring ecosystems, biodiversity, soil is tackled uh, regarding the ecosystems and in the land use, land uh, and changing the land use and uh, how is the land use uh, uh, and change the land. Uh, no change the, how the land is used and next please and then we have we look at strategy 218 the zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment next um there uh, prevent pollution is uh, also an issue which uh, is related to soil uh, and here better monitoring better reporting and uh, means we have to prevent and we have to remedy soil pollution. This is definitely an issue for whole Europe, as I said before. And uh, finally, uh, the Commission will adopt the zero uh, 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 pollution action plan for air, water, and soil. Uh, so um, that means uh, many thanks for your audience. That means uh, the green plan is what we are looking now at in Europe. Many thanks for your audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bern. I think it was a very, very comprehensive from the, the important aspects that we learned from Europe. And now uh, I would like to call our next speaker from the region. Let's make sure here I have the right name. Rosalina Gonzalez from Latin America and the Caribbean, Universidad de La Salle in Colombia. Dr. Rosalina. Muy buenos días a todos. Eh, muchas gracias por esta invitación, por esta invitación tan importante. Voy a hablarles acerca del estado de la contaminación del suelo en América Latina y el Caribe. En ese sentido, quiero comentarles que los principales direccionadores de la contaminación del suelo son la agricultura, la minería, la extracción, transporte y procesamiento de petróleo y aquello que tiene que ver con el manejo inadecuado de residuos sólidos y aguas residuales municipales. En cuanto a las prácticas agrícolas, es importante mencionar que en América Latina el uso de pesticidas por área ha llegado pues, a niveles que van entre 2.27 y 5.37 kilogramos por hectárea y con gran preocupación observamos cómo en el uso mundial de plaguicidas y pesticidas en Colombia hay tres países, entre ellos Brasil, Argentina y Colombia, dentro del top 10 de plaguicidas así como también la utilización de fertilizantes ha llegado a valores que están del orden de 140 kilogramos por hectárea arable y el uso de materiales de residuos de animales utilizados también en suelos, entonces están generando un impacto. ¿Cuál es la situación más preocupante? Y es que no se ha analizado 
Primero, ese impacto que ocasiona sobre las características físico, químicas y biológicas sobre el suelo y es un gran área de estudio para investigar y para determinar exactamente qué es lo que está ocasionando. Por otro lado, la minería y la industria de petróleo es un factor fuerte de contaminación del suelo en América Latina y el Caribe y es así como en los países de la región se observa bastante y con gran preocupación también algo que se ha observado es la minería ilegal que en este sentido implica el uso de una serie de materiales que aún no regulados están utilizando en el suelo. En cuanto al tema del transporte, de la extracción de petróleo, muchos de los países de nuestra región lo están realizando, pero desafortunadamente hay situaciones como el hurto de hidrocarburos y aún como situaciones de tipo terrorista, donde voladuras en los oleoductos, donde eh, situaciones de hurto generan eh, mucha contaminación debido a un continuo lixiviado de estos materiales a través del suelo y, y obligan a una serie de medidas de remediación y legislación en este sentido. También es de destacar que nosotros al tener alrededor de 7.5 millones de barriles por día eh, que están saliendo de nuestra región, implica esto pues que debemos trabajar en este tema también de una manera mucho más fuerte. El otro tema es el manejo de residuos sólidos y el vertimiento que se está haciendo sobre el suelo de aguas residuales. Se proyecta que para 2050 América Latina estará generando 670 mil toneladas por día de residuos sólidos y aún se observa que hay un gran porcentaje de lugares donde la disposición se hace en botaderos o basurales a cielo abierto, que esto implica realmente un gran impacto sobre el suelo y que es uno de los grandes retos que tiene la región para trabajar allí. Eh, desafortunadamente, solo para 2017 el 31% de la población contaba con una gestión del tema sanitario adecuado, pero todavía hay alrededor de un 20% donde vemos temas como defecación al aire libre o servicios de saneamiento sin mejoras o limitado, que implica un impacto directo al recurso en ese sentido. Y la situación que tiene que ver con vertimientos de aguas residuales, ya sea tratadas o no tratadas, sobre el suelo, donde se observa que solamente el 60% de la población está conectada a sistemas de tratamiento de agua residual y solo el, del 30 al 40% de ese volumen es tratado. Entonces, el resto, ¿qué está pasando con ese resto de material? ¿Cómo está llegando y cómo está haciendo esa relación entre suelo, características físico, químicas y biológicas? Entonces, hace mucha falta en ese sentido el estudio en la región como tal. ¿Cuáles se observan como principales contaminantes? En materia de sustancias orgánicas, pesticidas, hidrocarburos, sustancias farmacéuticas, medicamentos y productos de belleza, también como plásticos y, su y sustancias poliméricas sintéticas. En cuanto a metales, se observa el plomo, el cadmio, el mercurio y otros contaminantes emergentes y plásticos y microplásticos. Sin embargo, hay un problema que es mucho más de fondo y ya nuestros compañeros lo han mencionado y que tiene que ver con la legislación. En materia de la región hay marcos ambientales globales y regulaciones que son asociadas. Un ejemplo, el tema de salud pública, el tema de residuos sólidos, pero solamente encontramos unos muy pocos países, entre ellos México, Costa Rica, Honduras, Perú, Argentina, Ecuador y Brasil, con normativa específica en contaminación de suelos. ¿Qué significa? Que el resto no lo tiene. Entonces, al no tenerlo, al no tener aquellos valores límite, al no tener aquella información, pues se siguen presentando estas situaciones que nosotros observamos. Sabemos que la contaminación, el conocimiento de la contaminación del suelo está en esas etapas iniciales en la América Latina, los países lo entienden y empiezan a trabajar en ese sentido. Algunos problemas de salud pública asociados a contaminación de suelo están siendo documentados, pero al no tener información de base, pues todavía no se sabe y eso lo mencionó muy bien Natalia en su exposición. También observamos que hay una situación y es que el avance en conocimiento en la mayoría de estos países se hacen a nivel nacional y se derivan de proyectos financiados por instituciones internacionales como la FAO. En este sentido, ¿qué ocurre? Falta todavía un compromiso mucho más fuerte en promover proyectos locales en este campo y regionales con el fin de tender realmente a un ejercicio y a una solución a este problema porque como muy bien se mencionó, donde el suelo no se proteja, donde el suelo no deje de contaminarse, estamos expuestos a una extinción como especie. Entonces hay que tener mucho cuidado en ese sentido. Por eso es importante establecer eh, aquellos valores límite regionales, globales, para diferenciar 
diferentes temas de contaminantes de suelo, límites para sustancias químicas específicas, monitoreo permanente y monitoreo utilizando tecnología en ese sentido que sea muy rápida, que podamos verlo en tiempo real y generar indicadores internacionales para científicos, para generadores de política pública que realmente puedan combatir la polución, la polución y que esos vacíos de información sean llenados allí. También necesitamos en la región el apoyo en temas de información, tecnología, inversión en, en maquinaria y en equipos y tecnología para remediar la contaminación del suelo en América Latina y el Caribe. Queremos hacerlo, estamos dispuestos y eh, pues este era un mensaje que quería brindarles con el fin de poder trabajar juntos en este sentido. Nuevamente, muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, Rosalina. Excelente presentación. Déjame recordar a los participantes que todas las presentaciones, los documentos, el vídeo estará disponible online eh, en el sitio que nuestros colegas nos va a hacer llegar por el chat. Uh, let me invite now uh, our dear Talal Darwish from Remote Sensing Center in Lebanon uh, to give us the status of soil pollution near East and North Africa. Dr. Darwish, dear Talal. You have the floor, I can't see you. Is there a problem with the connection with Talal? Okay, do you hear me now? I hear you, I can't see good, you. Let me... good, good afternoon. Uh, You're I, I see... Now you see me? Five minutes, five minutes, okay? Yeah, you see me now? Okay. Uh, to classify uh, the source of contaminant in the NENA region, we used a criteria like persistence and uh, the availability of uh, 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 this uh, 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 contaminant. And uh, the results, based on the review of published literature from the uh, NENA countries, revealed um, slight or minor to moderate risk from agriculture, livestock production, uh, increasing risk with, from mining and industry. But uh, energy uh, production, transport, waste management, and dust storms represent a moderate a major source of contamination in the area. Using the FAUSTAT uh, data on uh, pesticide use in the NENA countries revealed uh, extreme, extreme excess of uh, pesticide application to soil in Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, and some other countries uh, applying excess uh, amount. Uh, but the most uh, 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 used or treated or studied uh, hazard in the NENA region is the trace element. And uh, uh, as you can see here in the table, these trace elements are listed in decreasing orders. Uh, uh, values reported from Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Palestine, Tunisia are uh, 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 warning and require uh, intervention for and remediation. Uh, uh, other countries presenting lower values need uh, uh, an intervention uh, to prevent further deterioration of land quality. Uh, we uh, uh, advise, consulted the experts' uh, opinion uh, from the Nina region about the most used uh, uh, um, uh, techniques for uh, uh, soil remediation. Uh, the results showed that nanotechnology and beer remediation were the least used methods in the region. Uh, data derived from published literature showed uh, in Algeria good advance in techno soil reconstruction from uh, 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 degraded uh, industrial wastelands. Beside the uh, good success of the use of microorganisms uh, to be degrade petroleum product in contaminated soils. Uh, in addition, in Saudi Arabia, uh, they successfully tested the anaerobic digestion of organic fraction and pyrolysis of plastics uh, for the management of solid waste 
and uh, yeah, very well used is the synergy between plants and pots, degrading and detoxifying bacteria. Yeah. Uh, besides, in Syria, a preliminary uh, bioremediation of oil spills and phytoremediation of stress element polluted soil was successfully tested in the soils of Derzur, Raqqa, Kamishli, and Idlib. Uh, in general, pollution from waste is a common problem uh, in the Nana region, notably in urbanized area. Uh, fortunately, uh, a high rate of these countries have ratified the Basel, Rotterdam, Stockholm, Minamata Conventions. Um, but unfortunately, most Nana countries still lack specific laws on soil pollution. Um, mm, uh, solving the issues of land degradation and soil degradation in the Nina region is still within the uh, NAP National Action Program, focusing mainly on soil salinity erosion and other soil degradation uh, processes. Um, of, sure, we need technical assessment surveys on soil pollution and soil remediation, but these are mainly oriented towards laboratory assays pilot science and peer-reviewed journals. We need more link between science and policy and field. Uh, the management of polluted soils requires a functional, updated soil information system to enable land quality, a permanent monetary assessment and monitoring. To conclude, studies on the hazard from pollution in NENA countries focused mainly on trace elements, the assessment of the status of soil pollution with other contaminants like pesticides, rabbinate lights, microplastics, or nanoplastic uh, is still at an early stage. Uh, Radionic light pollution was reported only in five countries uh, of the NENA region. The assessment and monitoring of soil pollution uh, continues to receive a Tension from the academia and researchers, but it has to rise to the level of a regular national assessment and monitoring policies and programs. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Talal. Thank you particularly for being so sharp into the time. Nice presentation, which you'll we'll be happy to share. And you will Thank notice you. That, that we are learning here that soil pollution is a global problem. Uh, from different regions. Let's look at the North American case. I invite uh, Dr. Jeffrey Simery from University of Wisconsin. Uh, Jeffrey, are you here with us? Yes, I can I, see you there. Hi. I am. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, the status of soil pollution in North America can be summed up by the statement, big countries plus big economies equal big soil pollution problems. Uh, in the United States, one third of the population lives within five kilometers of a contaminated soil brownfield site. And in the state of Colorado, there are 23,000 abandoned mines. Similarly, in Canada, there are 23,000 federally owned contaminated sites alone. However, no single information source tracks polluted land on a national scale in either country. Both countries do realize this is a significant data gap that impedes soil remediation. Where we are making progress is in mapping geogenic sources of soil pollution. Uh, the United States Geologic Survey has developed a mineral atlas which shows background soil elemental levels throughout the continental United States. On the left is soil lead, on the right is soil arsenic, and they have many other elements as well. This information is really important in developing soil remediation plans, so scarce resources are allocated where they will have the greatest impact. Canada is developing similar data, but on a provincial scale. Agriculture. The agriculture industry is an important source of soil pollution in North America. Both countries have large amounts of land devoted to crop production. Fertilizer usage has increased 215% since 1960, and we know that soil-bound fertilizer runoff leads to water quality impairment. Pesticide usage, on the other hand, peaked in 1981 and has fallen since then, which is good for soil, this is largely due to the use of genetically modified crops, which require fewer pesticides. We have found that improved farm management practices have been shown to positively impact soil pollution and water pollution at a relatively low cost. 
even small improvements in these practices can yield large results due to the amount of land affected. One new area of high concern is with the hundreds of unique polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances or PFAS found in a wide range of consumer, commercial and industrial products. Soil pollution by PFAS has impacted the drinking water for over 110 million people in almost every state in the US. Soil analytical methods for these compounds are complicated and for many don't yet exist, making soil screening standards hard to develop. In 2019, Canada developed soil standards for a few PFAS compounds, and the United States Environmental Protection Agency is devoting significant energy to develop methods and regulatory guidance. It is estimated that PFAS cleanup costs will exceed $10 billion for natural resources alone, not including personal health damage costs. PFAS will be a big problem for decades to come. Fortunately, the United States and Canada have a lengthy and productive environmental partnership. Our 9,000 kilometer border of diverse geography and ecosystems requires close cooperation at all governmental levels. The two federal governments have over 40 agreements and the states and provinces over 100 additional agreements, which help provide a uniform framework for managing soil pollution. Now, much of the news about soil pollution is negative. I'd like to share a little bit of good news. As someone who researches soil health soil-led health impacts, I find it encouraging that over the past 40 years, the percentage of US children whose blood lead levels exceeded the 10 microgram per deciliter poisoning standard decreased from 88 to less than 1%. Reducing soil-led contamination and exposure to contaminated soil has played an important role in this reduction and proves that concentrated effort to address soil pollution can have concrete health impacts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Excellent presentation and encouraging above all, as the, the problem is big, but uh, looks like the solutions are there. There to are cover, solutions, thank you. Indeed. Uh, to cover the world, uh, we are missing Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm very pleased to invite uh, Marine Blau uh, from South Africa. Uh, um, she works in the Terra Africa program. Marine, can I see you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me? You are most welcome. We can hear you well. The floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, warm greetings to everybody from a cold South Africa. Um, okay, so the region that I looked at has 48 countries and it's divided in five different subregions based on the geographical position. I, I think the one characteristic that will summarize a lot of the contamination or the risk that soil contamination has is the rapid population growth that the region has seen. Um, it went from 227 million in 1960 to 1.8 billion in 2018. And a recent, a recent Lancet report in um, October last year said that some of the countries are predicted to have a doubling or a tripling or even an eightfold increase in um, population numbers until 21,000. Um, apart from that, there is the scary thing that the region's disease burden has always come from infectious diseases, but the risk of non-communicable diseases are growing, especially cancer and um, respiratory related diseases. And some of the carcinogens identified already is, um, has been identified as main con soil contaminants in the region. Um, to date, no large scale assessment of regional soil pollution has been done. Um, small areas, um, uh, research based reports, but no report that shows extensive areas, the size of pollution plumes and the mixture of contaminants that are present. Um, so the, the, the work that was done was based largely on a literature reviews of um, academic reports and programs, also work that's been done by NGOs on addressing soil pollution. And from all this data, mining is regarded as the most significant source of soil pollution in the region, followed by, by waste management, industrial activities, agriculture and oil extraction. Looking at the main contaminants in the, in the region, um, trace elements by far has been mentioned in research as, as the biggest contaminant. This is followed by hydrocarbon 
antioxidants and polychlorinated biofilm oils. I just want to emphasize that just because trace elements were flagged so high and mining as the main industry doesn't mean these other pollutants doesn't exist in the region. It's just that the research is very limited on this. Okay, so just looking at the main culprit according to the research, um, minerals, Africa has the largest mineral industry in the world, and we're blessed with so many resources ranging from gold, diamonds, um, cobalt, copper, um, most of these which are extracted and um, exported to other regions in the world. Um, the mining industry in Africa can be divided into two different sectors. Um, there's the large scale mines operated by mining companies um, where the entire process can lead to soil contamination from the dust fallout coming from tailings facilities, the processing of ore at smelters, the waste storage facilities, as well as the dust suppression on all roads where they use other compounds in the water to try and suppress the dust. There's also the issue of acid mine drainage, um, especially associated with gold mining activities that lower soil pH and increase the risk of um, trace element mobility. Then the small and artisanal mining, which is a contributor to a large part of 23 at least of the regional countries economies. The two main soil contaminants identified here for the extraction of gold is mercury. And cyanide is also now being used in some countries such as the United Republic of Tanzania, Zimbabwe and Burkina Faso. Um, following the toxic sites investigation, investigation program by which sites can be registered as contaminated, um, mercury has already been registered for 75 sites in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's been estimated that it might affect the health of 2.4 million people. Um, there's also reports um, on oil spills. Um, the most reports comes from Nigeria, um, where more than 4,000 oil spills have been reported since 1960, uh, or between 1960 and 2010. And then Angola has also started to report some reports on oil spills, especially for the provinces of Cabinda and Zaire since 2009. Then looking at another significant um, contributor to, to soil pollution, which I think is a, is a growing risk, and that is the, 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 the shift in waste as a pollution, a source of soil pollution as a result of urbanization in the region. So a massive urbanization um, trend um, from 567 million people in 2015 to 950 million people predicted um, to live in urban areas in 2050. And this is accompanied by a massive increase in municipal solid waste from um, what was 80, 81 million tons to a predicted 244 million tons in 2025. Now, the current recycling rate of municipal solid waste in the region is 4%. Um, most of the waste ends up on open waste sites where it's burned without prior sorting. Uh, the different papers show the mixtures of waste, including medical waste, uh, agricultural waste, as well as um, electronic waste, which is becoming an, a, a larger component of waste sites now where it is directly recycled um, by e-waste recyclers, usually by means of open burning. Um, soil at and around these waste sites have been analyzed for contaminants, and it's found that there's trace elements such as cobalt, copper, lead, mercury, nickel, vanadium, as well as persistent organic pollutants, including PCBs and chlorinated and brominated dioxin-like compounds. Um, and then, uh, like after I've mentioned the, the population increase, the massive trend of urban, urbanization, uh, the traditional land use zoning, as, as, we, as we know it, of letting people settle in, in residential areas to prevent them from direct um, exposure to soil contamination is, is not happening in these countries. As people rush to the cities in, uh, to find jobs or opportunities working on mines and in industrial areas, they settle very closely to these areas, sometimes between the activities. And this increases the human health risk that's associated by the soil contamination. Then looking at the steps that's already been done to address um, soil pollution in the region, um, as mentioned by earlier speakers, there's the international conventions. Uh, while some 
countries have embraced all of these or signed them, um, there was a lesser adoption of the Minamata Convention to prevent mercury emissions, um, perhaps because some countries know that um, mercury is used for the extraction of gold by artisanal miners and that it contributes a large part to their economies. Um, the region has also taken action. In 1991, um, there was after, after the import of hazardous waste onto African land in the 1980s and um, at the end of 1990, the region said that they would they want to prevent any hazardous waste from entering the region and set up the Bamako Convention. There was it was assigned but but not widely adopted, and then um, in a nudge to to promote action again. Um, the region said that, okay, there will be the liberal declaration, basically nudging countries to say, you have a problem with hazardous waste imposed, you should look at this. From the regional conventions, um, national legislation filtered um, into 45 out of the 48 countries that address certain aspects of soil pollution. It's basically industry related. Um, issues of soil pollution might be addressed in mining legislation or um, environmental framework legislation. Pesticides are also addressed in some countries' agricultural um, legislation. However, there is only three countries in the region that have a definite set of reference values which, against which soil samples contamin contaminant levels can be measured. These countries are Burkina Faso, South Africa, and the United Republic of Tanzania. Um, when comparing these values to each other, there's also differences in, in that. Comparing it to international values, such as the Canadian values, there's a massive increase in or a massive difference in what is tolerated in the African countries and that which is tolerated in Canada. And then looking at le legislation specifically focused on soil prevention and management, um, only two pieces of legislation were found, and that is in Namibia and Burundi. So then addressing soil pollution- I'm from afraid you have to round up, Marini. Sorry to interrupt because you're running against out of time, sorry. Okay. You can round up quickly. Okay, that's fine. So um, a lot of work has been done by some academic institutions, um, also both on detection as well as remediation. However, there is a big need to collaborate the information and the work that's been done by different organizations um, to, to form a, a total picture of what it looks like in the region, also to identify the massive information gaps. We, there's a need for soil specific legislation to address soil contamination and then also to focus on large scale communication and education efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much and apologies for interrupting, but uh, our um, agreement with the, the system and the interpreters was to run from 12.30 to 2.30 p.m., uh, which is 2.30 p.m. now in Rome. I know that we are in a wide range of time. That's 8.30 in La Paz, it's 10.30 in Australia, in Newcastle, Australia, where the Navi is there, 10.30 uh, p.m. Uh, thank you so much for enduring with us, but uh, um, we have a problem of time. And before we advance for the next presentation, I would like to agree with you that we we all, we are, I'm learning so much. I hope that you are learning as much as I am. For me, it's uh, it's like drinking from the, 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 the fireman who's, you see this amount of information that is arriving to us on, on how to address it. And I would like to, to thank the colleagues from the seven regions that present to us the status on the regions. And I, it would be a pity if we don't complete with the two presentations that are missing for um, uh, us to address uh, concrete uh, uh, examples of remediation of soil pollution. So uh, if you bear with us for another 15 minutes, and I'd like to extend special thank you for the interpreters. Interpretation is continuing um, for the next 15 minutes. I would just like to ask uh, uh, both Dr. Peters and Dr. DeFrey to, to be as concise as possible for us to complete on time. Um, I would like to invite them to go to the next session. Mr. Bavo Peters from the European Commission on the EU Action Plan towards zero pollution for air, water, and soil. You have the floor, Bavo. Are you there with us, uh, Isabel, if you can spot Bob on the screen? Yeah. 
Dear Eduardo, it seems that Babo have problems with connections because he was here before, but he's not now. So maybe we can move with the next speaker. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. So why don't we do this while Babo reconnects? Let's go for Johan de Frey, uh, chair of the Nicol Network. He will explain to you, to us, what Nicole's evolution is a multi-stakeholder network in tackling industrial soil contamination. Uh, Johan. Hi, good uh, afternoon or good morning and or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you uh, for introducing me. Um, I'll speak as concise as I can, as I can uh, to talk a little bit about our network's evolution as a multi-stakeholder network uh, tackling industrial soil pollution. So maybe start with briefly what, what is NICOL? Um, it's, an, it's a network of uh, three types of members, academia, so we have different universities as members, industry, uh, mostly multinationals, and then consultants who work in the field of uh, contaminated land and groundwater. And so it's a professional network of those individuals that work in the contaminated land space. And typically what we do, we try to exchange knowledge and, and skills and experience in how you deal with contaminated land or contaminated industrial land uh, more specifically. In that respect, we were also invited to contribute to the, uh, the global assessment of soil pollution report, uh, which, which uh, we were very honored to be asked to do that. We have working groups that you know, tackle particular topics such as mercury or asbestos in soil and so forth, as you would imagine, and we try to convene twice a year, uh, these days obviously mostly virtually, um, to exchange and have, and have that oh, our individuals uh, meet each other. I think it's, a, or the, the topic at hand here for, for us was to share a little bit how we, from our inception in 1996, evolved over the years in terms of, of focus. And initially, as is or was the case in, in, in a lot of jurisdictions, we focus primarily on the regulatory compliance, making sure that we clean up against uh, given standards and concentrations that you need to achieve, obviously based on science and, 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 and factual information. But we rapidly saw, and again, this is an evolution that you see in other regions as well, is that it is very hard to clean up land up to pristine original conditions. So the concept of risk-based remediation came to the fore, and I'll, I have one slide on, on to dwell on it a little bit. We've moved on from there to sustainable remediation and including, in fact, in, in remedial approach, the concept of sustainability. And these days, we're even going a step further where we introduce the concept of land stewardship, which is a fairly new concept. It's not an easy concept. And again, I'll, I'll dwell uh, briefly on it. So risk-based remediation, it's been mentioned by, by some of the previous speakers. It's really looking at three components, having the source of pollution, the pathway, which could be airborne, could be dust, could be through water transportation, and ultimately it reaches a receptor who could be a human receptor, um, a, a protected area, could be groundwater that is used for drinking water purposes. So that is defined by the local circumstances. And um, in essence, it really means that you acknowledge that total removal, as I said, of pollution is often not possible, physically not possible. Often there's also a financial component to it, but often it is physically because of the age, the distribution, the depth, it's just impossible. So risk-based remediation is these days the core approach to handling pollution um, of an industrial site. We've moved on from there, as I mentioned, and we've introduced uh, sustainability concepts it's not widely applied, but there are some good examples of, of organizations that have applied it or are applying it, where you, as, as most of you know, you not only look at the environmental aspect or the technical solution, but you include social and economic factors. And really the, 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 the crux of sustainable remediation revolves around how you communicate with relevant stakeholders. So not only the owner operator and, and the regulator, if you like, but also, also tenants, uh, neighbors, uh, residential areas in the neighborhood and so forth. And you bring them all into the, into the conversation and discuss upfront um, how you will tackle remediation. And you, and you need to do it upfront to make sure that you get buy-in, you get everybody's concerns on the table, and only then will you decide how you remediate and what your technical solution is. 
We have a whole uh, uh, framework that we've developed. I invite you to go to our website. Uh, the link is in, in one of the previous slides. I won't dwell on it, but it, it describes in detail how you incorporate sustainability thinking in a remedial approach. The London Olympics in 2012 were actually the most impressive example of applying sustainability to clean up and redevelopment of land. I won't dwell on it. If you Google it, there are numerous articles and publications that uh, explain it, but it was quite an impressive and early demonstration of if you, if you set it as an ambition, it's actually achievable. It was very impressive as an outcome. And mind you, the Olympic Park these days is not a white elephant. It is still being used. A lot of the buildings that were supposedly recyclable and, demolish and demolishable, if that's an English word, um, are still in use. So all of the, the, the concept of circularity was, was introduced um, almost as a hindsight in, uh, in reusing the Olympic site. Last slide, um, current and future developments of the Nicole network. So I mentioned land stewardship. We have a publication in 2019 where we explain the concept and it really is introducing the idea of circularity in managing land and valuing land and soil, if you like, for their, their intrinsic um, values that they bring. Um, we try to apply to industrial land, which is not easy. In particular, it's difficult when you have an industrial occupation spanning several decades with all the related pollution that goes with it. But we do believe that with creativity, and when you do need to hand it over and you've been a good steward of your land, that there are ways of, of renewing the land and, and making it useful for a next purpose, whatever that might be. Um, we're also looking at liability transfer, environmental liability transfer of contaminated land in Europe and how that works, what different jurisdictions uh, provide or don't provide. Often it's very difficult to transfer a liability. Obviously, the pollution, the polluter pays principle applies. Um, and so handing over liability is, is, is a difficult and, and very tricky concept. But we, we thought it would be useful to uh, look at experiences and on how it's possible or not possible and, and how it's been handled in, in different uh, countries in Europe. And then uh, last two points, given that we are 25 years old, um, we are also thinking about what could be the next 25 years, what new can we bring to Europe and the world, if you like. And we're looking at establishing a foundation that actually harnesses the skills of the collective membership that we have. And if you look at the environmental world, we're, we're seeing in, in our own network and elsewhere that the first full-time 40 or 50 years um, of full-time practicing of environmental solutions, that first generation is retiring, but is still very active and obviously has an enormous amount of experience and skills that they can reuse and they are willing to reuse. So again, it's something we're exploring um, and we're making good headway there. And then finally, I'm happy to share that we also have some spin-offs uh, from members that are active in those regions in uh, Latin America and Africa. And so we have a growing interaction with those regions in terms of sharing experience, skill sets, and what have you. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. It, even in the chat, people are already asking for your email. So I can see it there, nansunicole.org. A strong interest. Congratulations for the good work. Let's see if Bavo connected. Bavo, are you there? I'm here. Good. Uh, so if you can shorten up your presentation as we are over time now. Yeah, I will try. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to bring the Zero Pollution Action Plan for Air, Water and Soil to your attention today. Uh, this plan was launched three weeks ago by the European Commission, and it's an important uh, building block of the European Green Deal. As you might know, the Green Deal is our strategy to make the EU uh, more sustainable and climate neutral. Now, why do we, do we need to act? Uh, it's already been said uh, several times. Um, our human health is closely connected to the health of our planet. Uh, currently in the EU, one in eight deaths uh, is linked to pollution and then especially air pollution. 90% uh, of these deaths uh, are due to chronic, chronic diseases uh, of which cancer is the most frequent one. 
when it comes to the health of our planet, uh, a toxic free environment is crucial to, to protect our uh, biodiversity and ecosystems. Pollution is one of the five main drivers of, of biodiversity loss, and it's also closely linked to climate change and our hunger for resources. Um, pollution is expected to, to worsen uh, until 2050, unless we manage to turn the trend. So here you see an overview of the structure of the Green Deal and how the action plan fits in. The Zero Pollution Action Plan goes hand in hand uh, with the EU goals for climate neutrality, sustainable food, biodiversity, mobility, and resource efficiency. The action plan aims to implement the Green Deal vision for a zero pollution ambition uh, for a toxic free environment, and this by 2050. Now, what does this mean? Uh, the zero pollution ambition does not mean we intend to, to reduce pollution to an absolute zero. Uh, this would not be feasible and realistic. It's rather an objective to reduce pollution by 2050 to levels which are no longer harmful for human health and for our environment, and in that way to respect the boundaries of our planet. The action plan is broad, uh, cross-sectoral, and, and, and it's an integrated strategy. Such an approach is new, but also very necessary. Um, many different sectors emit thousands of pollutants and chemicals, and eventually these end up in our environment, in our air, water, and soil. So a holistic perspective is, is absolutely necessary uh, to address the complex chain of pollution from the source uh, to, to the end of the pipe. And therefore, the plan brings together measures from different policy domains, and you see them here, agriculture, transport, energy, industry, etc. The plan puts also forward a, a pollution hierarchy, so the, the upside down pyramid that you see here. Contamination should be prevented as much as possible at the source, uh, because prevention is the most uh, efficient, cost-efficient way to, to solve the pollution problem. But sometimes pollution cannot be avoided, and then emissions should be minimized and controlled uh, as much as possible, for example, through uh, environmental permits. And only if all of this has failed, remediation could be the solution of last resort. So now let's have a look uh, at some of the actions uh, that relate to, to soil in the action plan. Um, before the end of this year, the commission will come forward with a proposal and an impact assessment for a new uh, law on nature restoration. Uh, and this means uh, legal obligations for member states to restore degraded ecosystems. And since we consider soils as an ecosystem in their own right, uh, this law should also cover the restoration of degraded soils and certainly the most carbon rich uh, soils. The proposal will also contain a mechanism to, to map, assess and achieve good condition of ecosystems, um, but all of this is, is still work in progress and under discussion. The EU already has rules uh, for the treatment of wastewater and the application of sewage sludge on agricultural land. We will evaluate these policies and see if they are still fit for purpose. Uh, and if needed, these directives will be revised and adapted to the new Green Deal ambition. We will also evaluate the Environmental Liability Directive, and, and that's a piece of legislation that uh, defines who is liable in case of environmental damage and pollution. Uh, this is very important to make sure that the polluter pays principle is properly applied, also for soil contamination. Um, the Commission will also come with a proposal to change the rules and the scope of the Industrial Emissions Directive. 
um, in the EU, certain uh, industrial activities require environmental permits and they have to apply the best available techniques. Uh, such operators also have to do uh, a baseline report or a soil investigation when they start and end their activity. And if they cause pollution, well, then they will have to remediate that contamination. The Commission will also uh, review the waste laws. This, of course, has an impact on soil quality uh, because improper waste management is an important uh, source of soil pollution, as we already heard a couple of times today. Um, then the non-legislative actions, uh, still this year, the Commission will uh, uh, come forward with a new soil strategy. Such a strategy is not a law and is in that sense uh, similar to the Zero Pollution Action Plan. Um, the common denominator between uh, the soil strategy and Zero Pollution Action Plan is soil pollution. But the soil strategy will also address all other soil threats, you know, such as erosion, uh, organic matter decline, etc. The Commission also committed to reduce nutrient losses with 50% uh, and fertilizer was used with 20% by 2030 and this compared to 2015. And to achieve these targets, the Commission will uh, propose or adopt an integrated nutrient management action plan. Um, there's also an action on excavated soils. Uh, some countries in the EU already have a system in place to check and track the quality of excavated soil. Um, this is important to separate the clean soil from the contaminated soil and to prevent that uh, excavated soil can cause secondary contamination somewhere else. Uh, we will look at the good examples that are available and provide guidelines to track the quality and the transport of excavated soils, for example, through a, a soil passport. The EU will also establish a no, list sorry with... to interrupt. Please wrap up as we are over yeah. time. Thank okay. Um, so we will also develop a list uh, for soil contaminants, contaminants of very high concern. Um, we will also include additional pollution parameters in our Lucas Soil Survey, and we have a, a research uh, program on soil, uh, specifically dedicated to soil, including on soil pollution. So uh, if you want to read more and have a complete overview, you can uh, click on this link and read the full plan. It's available in all languages of the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think uh, we had a lot with the, all the presentations that we had today. I was telling you that I learned a lot, but my colleagues of the, the Global Soil Partnership and the UNEP that are participating here with us, and I recognize Abdelka, there's a strong work with Natalia uh, on uh, organizing the, the event and the preparation of the report. They want to know uh, if we really learn it. So. Uh, they want to launch a quiz. There was some debate what a quiz is, what the prize is. Let's see what it is. Isabel, are you ready to launch the first question for the quiz? We will all be able to participate online. You just have to click on the answer that will come on your screen with the questions that will come on your screen. So Isabel Verbeck from the, the Global Soil Partnership is gonna help us with the Global <laughs> Assessment of Soil Pollution Quiz. The floor is yours. Many thanks, Eduardo. Uh, first, how to access the quiz. Huh? So you can either click on the link um, my colleague is right now posting uh, on the chat or search for menti.com and insert the code shown on the screen. Okay. Um, I suggest you use your smartphone so you can see the leaderboard that will be shown on this screen. Huh? So let's start now and assess. Um, um, whether you've been following the keynote presentation and how much you've learned. We will start now with a warm-up question, why all participants are connecting. So this question uh, is not part of the quiz, but is a question addressed to all of you, participants from so many countries. So uh, is soil pollution an issue in your country? Okay, I think uh, there is no doubt. 
um, number are speaking by themselves, and this is this is a real issue. So we will now start uh, our quiz with the first question. Please put in your first name and last name so we know who the winners are. Huh? And be ready to answer quickly as the first 10 winner will receive the soil kit, composed of shopper, gadgets, and the global assessment of soil pollution summary for policymaker. Already, let's go with the question one. What percentage of the world's soils is affected by pollution? A, about 32% of global soils are polluted. B, only industrial soils are polluted. C, there are major knowledge gaps and we do not know in detail the extent and degree of pollution affecting the world's soils. And D, we are only aware of 16% of polluted soils. Okay, so the correct answer is C. Indeed, there is um, still a lot to learn about this growing threat. The report is an important milestone, but there are still major knowledge gaps on the extent and degree of soil pollution. Let's continue now to the second question. Soil pollution effects. A. Soil health, B, hair and water quality, C, human health, D, all of the above. A few more seconds. Okay, undeniably, the right answer is D. Soil pollution affects the food we eat, the water we drink, the hair we breathe, and the health of all organisms on the planet, including humans. All right, let's go now to the third question. What is the main source of soil pollution? As identified in, in the report that was just launched. A, industrial activities and mining. B, unsustainable agriculture. C, geogenic source. D, war and military activities. E, improper waste management. A few more seconds to go. Okay. Indeed, uh, most of you are right. Industrial activities and mining uh, is the right answer. And that was um, illustrated in the report and in the presentation of my colleague, uh, Natalia. Let's move now to the final question, which is what are the priority actions in the fight against soil pollution? A, preventive measures, starting with education and awareness raising. B, strict legislation at national level. C, legislative and intervention frameworks harmonized at international level. D, strengthening cooperation at all levels from basic research to the exchange of experience and technology. And E, all of the above. Okay, very good. Indeed, the right answer is E, communication and cooperation among a wide range of actors need to be reinforced for our fight against soil pollution. Okay, it's now time to see who the winner are. The winners are, here they are. So very well done, congratulations to all of you. Please send me a private uh, message now on the chat with your email so we can ship your price. Um, I hope you enjoy, you learn a lot with the quiz, with the today webinar. Congratulations again, and back to you, Eduardo. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, colleagues. I think it was interesting and fun. Everybody has a smile on the face now because uh, uh, I failed one. Huh? I'm not telling you which one, <laughs> but it was, it was a nice exercise. Colleagues, um, it was an honor as director of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment to be invited to uh, moderate this uh, webinar and uh, be with you uh, during this session. Uh, the closure remarks 
Uh, we are very pleased to have here, very humble to have the Deputy Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, Madame Maria Elena Semedo, who accompanied us throughout the webinar, uh, was very patient as much as uh, all of you and our interpreters with my poor manage, time management, letting the time goes overboard. Madame Semedo is here with us and uh, she will uh, make the closing remarks of our webinar. Dr. Semedo, it's a great pleasure to have you here, ma'am. And uh, I will, I'm honored to pass you the floor. Good morning, good evening, good, after, good afternoon to all. Uh, colleagues, uh, participants, panelists, it's really my pleasure to greet you again. And I think my dad has have already greeted you, but it's really my pleasure. I think I muted. We can hear you, but we can't see you as is your camera is off. No. This is the CFS 48 session. I think you've got the wrong link. We no, can, but I can we can't follow you. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Okay. Is your, is your camera that is? Okay, let ah. me disconnect. Let me see. We can hear you well. Uh, okay. But I don't know what is going on. Murphy's law, it's always strikes in the meetings. We can uh, hear you perfectly, ma'am. It's probably- We can also see you. Yes, but this is the, this is the link to the 48th session of the CFS. Just carry on. Some can see you, some can hear you, and some can see you and hear you. <laughs> we are out of time. Maybe, um, but it's very strange because I can see you all. It's on your camera that's not operating, but your audio is perfect. Okay, give me just a moment. Or I move without the, the camera. Well, some can see you very well. I can see you very well. Ana Maria, can you come here? I can see you clearly too. You, you were on the CFS. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know what is my camera is on the CFS. Yes. I think you're in the link in the CFS link. No, but how can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> we can hear you perfectly. Yeah, so every every meet is a surprise. I mean, how how we, a person? We can, we can, can hear you perfectly well. What do you want? even in Australia? No, I'm here. No, so no, no, and you open these. Look, you open this one. No, because they can hear me. Bo. Ana Maria, questo è il CFS. Eh, sì. Silvia, chiudiamo. No, chiudi tu. Bear with me because Madame Semedo did the effort to wait uh, the whole session to stay with us. She would like to greet us before we close. And uh, there is this connection program. So this, uh, this is gonna come up. Uh, I wish we had more, more quiz uh, to make because it was really fun to, to go to the questions. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers and the interpreters for being with us uh, beyond the time um, uh, and making sure that uh, we could uh, go throughout the webinar. It's impressive to see that this new reality brought us this condition that with uh, relatively low costs, uh, we can keep Ravi awake late hours in Australia, and we can, you, you can wake up uh, the vice president of Bolivia at 6 a.m. in La Paz. And we are all together at the same time, thanks to the technology that uh, still evolving, right? We are still learning how to use it. Um, but I, I have a son who works on IT, and he tells me that if there is something that you can't do with your phone, it's going to disappear uh, in the future. So you have to be able to to communicate and connect all the time. Let's, let me see if we can get Madame Semedo back. There she is, connecting now with video and audio. Madame, we are very pleased to have you back. Uh, you can activate your microphone now. We have your image, but we don't have your mic. It's muted. Okay. Now it's full. The okay. floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know what happened, but uh, okay, it was a good way to, to close the meeting. Uh, I was saying that it's really my pleasure to greet you again at the close of this remarkable event. I stayed here for the full time, and I think uh, not only Eduardo, but I also learned a lot, and it has been fantastic, the presentations. Uh, today, we anticipated the celebration of the World Environment Day, and we also contribute to the launch of the Decade on Eco of Ecosystem Restoration. Both urgent calls to protect our planet. And I would like to evoke the vice president, what he, he reminded us. We need to reconnect with nature, with Pachamama. We need a healthy living with healthy soils, healthy life, and healthy people. Dear participants, as stated in the resolution establishing the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, we need to prevent, halt, and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide, as degraded ecosystems affect 40% of the world's population, aggravating poverty and food insecurity. This new report provides undeniable evidence that protecting our soils from degradation and reducing soil pollution is more essential than ever. And uh, it has been already said that this event is a concrete result of the close collaboration between FAO, the Global Soil Partnership Intergovernment Technical Panel on Soils, and UNEP. And it was only possible thanks to the strong engagement of our members to promote sustainable soil management. And I would like to commend all the contributors to the report. It has said that it took two years to prepare the report. But also thank particularly the partners who financially support the Global Soil Partnership. The report brings to mind the collective work done in the context of the One Health approach on the interlinkages between healthy people, healthy animals, healthy plants, and healthy environment. And only by joining force can we tackle problems and scale up solutions. A call for more action was clear from the principles of UNEP and FAO. The report sets out a clear future path for the global communities towards addressing soil pollution for a zero pollution world. And the original presentation revealed that soil pollution is a global problem, indeed with some specificities. Our colleague from WHO remind us that everybody is affected by pollution, starting from our food. And let me recall the message from Inga. We need to stop soil pollution. We need to reverse the damage. We need stronger enforcement. And we need to make sure that science travels. And she call our attention that more than politicians, the report needs to reach the smallholder farmers. But we also need to invest in advocacy and awareness raising so that soil pollution is no longer a hidden reality. We are fully committed to implement the report's recommendation, but we need to do so together. We need healthy soils for a healthy life. You can count on FAO's Global Soil Partnership to facilitate the implementation of the Zero Soil Pollution Agenda. I would like to thank the organizers and Eduardo Mansour for, for, for facilitating the event. Let's all join forces and be the solution to soil pollution. I would like to conclude by wishing you all a happy Environment Day to reimagine, recreate, and restore ecosystems. Thank you again for your enthusiastic participation and commit commitment, and I wish you a happy Environment Day tomorrow. Thank you, Eduardo, over to you. Thank you, Madam. I think you deserve a round of applause. Virtual All applause of you. at that stage. <laughs>
and uh, also for our speakers, our audience, our interpreters, and the organizers, for the authors of the report, our congratulations. The webinar is over, but the, all the information is on, on the website. The link has been provided, it will be provided again uh, in the chat for you to make sure that uh, uh, you access and let's continue this dialogue. Once again, thank you very much for every single one of you. On behalf of FAO and UNEP, uh, we thank you for participating and we wish you a wonderful World Environment Day and a nice weekend ahead. All the best, everyone. All the best, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, great chairmanship. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much. Natalia, lo hiciste. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Everybody. Saludos. Greetings to Nairobi. Natalia. Yes, Thank, you much, Thank you. Thank you for the great job and collaboration. Wonderful example of, of collaboration between two UN sisters. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, we have to be one UN, right? Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Eduardo. Have Thank a good weekend, all. everybody. Thank you to the colleagues of Global Soil Partnership. Great job. Bye bye now. Bye. Bye bye. Ravi, thanks for being awake until now. What's it? 11 p.m. there. Ah, it's 11 p.m. now. It's great, um, great launch, and you did a fantastic job, of course, Natalia, for leadership. Thanks so much. <laughs> Hopefully, you. see you. Também bom dia para os colegas que estão no Brasil. Eu ouvi muitos dos meus colegas that I'm Brazilian, so let me grab the chance to greet my fellow citizens over there. Muchas gracias a los de Latinoamérica que estuvieron con nosotros. Merci a tous, a les collègues d'Afrique, d'Europe, a été un plaisir. Muchas gracias. Let's be the solution to soil pollution. The meeting is over, colleagues.